Reverend Dr. Raymond Anderson is an ordained Centers for Spiritual Living minister serving the Center for Spiritual Living Greater Baltimore community as our spiritual director. He has frequently been referred to as a Renaissance man and visionary new thought leader. I give you Reverend Dr. Ray. So today's topic is sort of a sensitive one because we're talking about this thing called fear. So I'm going to just go ahead and jump on in. The ultimate fear buster. We'll get to that in a moment. So the blurb says, most fears are summarized in a few false beliefs, such as nobody wants me. I am not needed. I am not loved. I am not worthy of anything. I am not enough. And so on and so on and so on. And these false beliefs are the cause of fear and the effect is fear itself. Okay. Fear arises from the false belief in duality, the belief in two powers. This is a belief that there may be a power opposed to God whose influence can attract evil to us. Yeah, we're going to get into this. <laughs> we release fear through the cultivation of faith, a faith founded on the thought that God is all there is. And keep in mind what Heather just spoke, what she declared as the spiritual practice, right? So ground and anchor to that. God is all there is. It is through this fear in two powers that we will always victimize ourselves. And in doing so, we fail to take responsibility that we are the ones in control of our thoughts, our feelings, and our emotions. When we blame something external as the cause of what we feel, we miss the opportunity to improve the relationship that we have with ourselves and therefore the relationship we have with others, including God. More on that later. So many of us have probably seen some version of this quote or statement, fear is a liar. No, it's not. Fear is not a liar. Fear is a sign. Fear is indicating that something is going on in our consciousness. Something is going on in our belief systems. Something is going on and it is a sign pointing the direction for us to address it. It is not lying any more than a detour sign is telling you there's construction down there, so take this exit. That's not a lie. It's simply a sign pointing the direction to say, do you want to address this? You don't? Well, keep on going then. It's not a lie. It's a sign. Titus Livy says, fear is always ready to see things worse than they are. Now, what does that mean? What we tend to do is we tend to over-exaggerate. We tend to make whatever the fear is something, something bigger. You know, we're afraid of the spider that's all of yay big, but in our imagination, we see it as you know, one of those spiders from when I was a, a kid and we used to watch the, you know, those B movies where there's a 50 foot spider moving through the lands of Texas. And so we see this tiny little spider, tiny little spider, and we imagine it huge with fangs and stuff. We imagine. So we always have this possibility of the fear being exaggerated being something that it's not. How many times has Tracy been sitting in her room and not to say, you know, just Tracy, but, you know, Tracy, because this reminded me of Tracy. And she heard a sound and in her imagination, the sound of whatever it was, the wind 
pushing something against the house. And in her mind, they're zombies. Oh my goodness. It's a zombie clock. It's a zombie clock. It's a zombie clock. Whatever that is, it's the zombies. And so what does Tracy do? She pulls the blanket over her head because if she can't see them, they can't see her. And that's what we tend to do is we tend, sorry, Tracy. That's what we tend to do is we tend to hide from the fear rather than face it head on. Today's talk is what we're going to encourage ourselves to do. Face the fear head on by seeing it as a sign directing us to heal whatever the fear is. So what are some of the things we potentially fear? You know, someone may fear homelessness. Someone may fear criticism, judgment. What if I'm wrong? Death. And we fear and we fear and we fear so many things. And because we tend to not address them, the fears amplify and magnify one another. One fear compounds another. One fear makes another fear even more. So the fear of criticism, well, if I'm being criticized and I'm being judged, then it means no one's going to want to be my friend and then I'm alone. So now I've compounded and three fears are now what I'm carrying on my back. The fear of criticism and judgment, the fear of being alone, the fear of failure, like all of these things compound one another. And yet, and yet, the thing we fear generally isn't the thing we think we fear. For example, we say, you know, I'm afraid of death. But is it really death that we're afraid of? Or are we afraid of the unknown? Pause and take that in, breathe. Is it death that fear you know, causes us to fear? Or is it, well, I don't know what happens when I die or anyone dies and I'm afraid of the unknown. And, and, who, whoa, 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 whoa. What if, what if I'm wrong? Like we say, you know, there's this idea that we are eternal, immortal, ever, you know, ever being beings because God can't die. But what if I'm wrong? What 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 if what if what if there's no heaven? There's no hell. There's nothing. What if there's nothing? So it's not death that we fear. It's the other stuff. So it's just like the image. It's not the hand that's casting the shadow. It's what we imagine the shadow to mean or the shadow to be that is actually what we are afraid of. Same thing with criticism. Someone can tell you, uh, Tracy, you know, I really don't like the, the, you know, remember that brownie thing you made? I really didn't like it. And uh, don't do it again. I'm criticizing her for making this brownie cake. Okay. But, but so what? They're simply words. But what does the criticism mean? Oh, the criticism means Ray's not going to ask me to make another cake. Oh, the criticism means he's judging me to be incompetent. Oh, the criticism means he's not going to ask me for anything again, which means I'm useless, which means, right? So see how that spirals. So it's not really the thing itself. Being alone isn't fearful. We're alone a lot of the time. But when we start to put this story to what being alone means, it means I'm not loved. It means I have no friends. It means I might die alone. I could be in the house for four days and no one would know. Like it's the story and what the story means. So once again, the fear isn't the issue. The fear is a sign pointing us in the direction of what am I being invited to address and to heal? Ernest Holmes says, if you could see the object of your fear until you really understand it, it would no longer exert any effect on you. You can do this to the degree where you become aware that you are divinely guided and protected and establish your understanding of this in a definite way. So once again, he's saying, don't focus on the fear itself. Focus on the fear as a sign. It's pointing you in the direction of 
What am I being invited to embody, to recognize and know? I am divinely guided. I am protected. I have an understanding of the truth of my being anchored in principle. And yet the fear is pointing out something in the same way that if, you know, if you get a cut and there's pain, the pain is, oh, you might want to do something, you know, put some peroxide or alcohol on it or put a Band-Aid on it or something. It's an indicator that something is seeking to be healed. Okay, so take that in for a second. Because we have an opportunity to, to fear less or to be faithful. And this exists consistently all the time, everywhere, every day, all the time. But the question is, if I'm experiencing fear, and the fear could be any number of things, what is fear? It's an unpleasant feeling triggered by the perception of or some real or imagined danger. So you could perceive a real danger, someone's breaking into my home, or you could perceive an imagined danger. There's a tree brushing against the house, but I don't know that, but I'm imagining it's someone breaking into the house, right? So it doesn't matter, it's real or perceived. And yet, if we're being invited to step into this space of being faithful or to have more faith, well, what is faith? Faith is confidence or trust in a person, a thing, a concept, et cetera. It's, it's confidence, trust, or confident trust. Well, it's important to recognize that this, this, this goes both ways, right? So the emotions or feelings are inspired by beliefs, which then become actions. Emotions of fear inspired by beliefs, the belief that someone is breaking in and what that means. They're going to rob me. They're going to beat me, et cetera. There's a belief, which then becomes our actions. I wake up. I cover my head. I wake up. I hide in the closet. I wake up. I you know go get a baseball bat. It inspires actions. Same thing with faith. Emotions, the emotion of faith, confident trust, inspired by a belief. There is only that power and presence that is God. I am protected. I am divinely guided. And what it is, I am. And the action, prayer and get a bat. Prayer and dial 911. Whatever. It's inspiring some form of action. Okay. Breathe that in. So Ernest Holmes says in the science of mind, in the glossary, fear the, antith the antithesis of faith. It is the negation of trust. Now pause right there. Because I disagree. Fear is not the antithesis of faith. Fear and faith are the same coin. Because you can have faith in. You could have confident trust that that sound you hear is someone breaking in. Right. I am confident that that's what it is and that that's what it means. And I trust it to such a degree that I am going to go get a knife to fend off the invaders. But, but it's the neighbor's tree. But it's the invaders because I can't see it. So I'm imagining. So it's not the antithesis of faith. It's not the opposite of faith in terms of there's faith and there's they are on the same continuum. It's a matter of. What am I having faith in? What do I trust? Right? Because I can trust someone who is evil in the same way that I can trust someone who is sacred or holy, whatever those words even mean. So let's continue, though, with what Holmes said. Like faith, fear can be conscious or unconscious. In other words, in your subjective mind. And if it is to be eliminated, which I say understood, and healed, it must be healed, addressed from both the conscious mind and the subjective mind. Because now, if we're talking about eliminating fear, then that means when there is ever a house on fire and the, the firefighter must run into it, 
they should have no fear. The person in the fire should have no fear. Just, you know, but it fear serves a purpose in that base nature of what it means to be a mammal. Fear gives us the opportunity for adrenaline to kick in to run and escape. So fear need not be eliminated. It needs to be understood. And when it is fear that is not operating or moving us in a manner that operates at our highest and best, in other words, the fear causes us to unnecessarily freeze, then it needs to be addressed. It needs to be healed. It needs to be exercised. Now, what does it mean to exercise one's fear? One, to understand in the same way that this film the, the little girl wasn't the thing to be afraid of. It wasn't the thing that the two priests were, quote unquote, battling. It was the thing back of her. It was the energy back of her that needed to be exercised, which means you recognize that there is the real, the young girl, and there is the lie, right? This thing that says, evil, you're bad. Yeah, well, that's not a truth. And yet you are pointing me in the direction of what am I invited to do? What am I invited to recognize? Oh, I am invited to cast you out because you do not serve me. So let's go back. There are some fears, the house on fire. It is a real fear that threatens one's body with pain and death. And there are some fears the fear of criticism that is a complete story because no one can say something to us. See, I could put my hand over a fire and it affects my flesh. It burns my hand. Someone could stand in front of me and criticize, 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 and it has no physical effect. It does not touch me unless I create a story within about what the criticism means and then internally it affects me and then internally because of that effect it shows up externally with things like high blood pressure stress anxiety etc so to exercise is to set one free from an internal source of bondage such as an unreasonable and unaddressed fear by using faith. And in this term, we are referring to truth. Because as I said, fear and faith, same coin. So how do you exercise fear? Bring truth into the mix. Breathe. So Ernest Holmes goes on to say that faith is an attitude of mind that is so convinced of its own idea that it accepts it so completely that any contradiction is inconceivable and impossible. Before we can create such a mental attitude, there must be nothing in our subjective mind that contradicts our objective affirmation. Now, don't know that I agree with that either, because I believe that you can still have something marinating in your subjective mind and still do what you need to do regarding truth and faith. Because this almost comes across as, in order for me to be perfect, I have to be perfect before I can be perfect. In order for me to be whole, perfect, and complete, and acknowledge all of the things that Heather spoke about in the spiritual practice, God is, I am. All that God is, I am that. But I have to be perfect before I can acknowledge that, before I can be convinced of it, before I can have faith in it and mm, mm, before I can declare it. And no, you work on it while you work on it. Same with anything else, whether that's exercise. I don't have to be healthy, quote unquote, in order to, to, to be healthy. I acknowledge that, you know, what I'm going to do is after my surgery, same thing. I'm going to start walking when I'm allowed to walk, you know, a couple of feet, then down the street, then a block, and then two blocks. And then I'll get back to my five miles to 10 miles a day. Doesn't have to be immediate. It can be both and. You can be healing whatever the 
thing is and moving forward and evolving. But it still takes a level of I see the sign and I know what is mine to do. So there's this binding force that holds the nucleus and electrons and all this stuff together. And that binding force, that binding energy is faith itself. It is the confident expression of the universe. The universe knows. The universe is faith itself. And so this binding force, everything, God is back of it. But not just back of it, because as Heather said, God is all there is. So God is back of it and in front of it. God is above it and below it. God is to the right and the left of it. God truly is all there is. So the binding energy of faith, the binding energy of faith is ever present. It binds respiration to such a degree that I know that when I exhale, there is a binding force that says there must be an inhale. There is a binding force that says when I ingest food, there is a binding force that causes it to go down my esophagus to my stomach, to then be broken down to nourish my body. A binding force that is absolute confident, absolute trust, the universe itself. So if we're going to really, really jump into this, then we have to say, so as Sophocles says, for those who are afraid, all are noises. Now, what, what, what does that mean? For those who are afraid, there's always going to be more to be afraid of because it's unaddressed. But why? Why is that the case? Simply because of the unknown and what our imagination does with the unknown. But when we are anchored in, in trust or anchored with trust, grounded in principle, then... We develop a level of understanding. As St. Francis said, I seek to understand rather than to be understood. For when I understand, then the understanding of others will come. When I know the truth, the truth will set me free. When I know the truth, then I am moving and operating in a form of faith that is grounded in principle rather than anchored in fear. Marie Curie says, nothing in life should be feared, only understood. Now is the time to understand more, to fear less. Nothing should be feared. Nothing in life should be feared. And let's capitalize that life. Nothing in the universe, the absolute, should be feared only understood and embodied. Remember that Holmes said, the only God any of us would truly understand and, and know is the one that we embody. So seek to understand what is the fear pointing us in the direction of? What is the fear indicating? Rather than trying to eliminate it, heal it. Rather than trying to deny it, address it. Reverend Ray says, fear and faith are not two separate things. They are two aspects of the same energy. Faith that says there is a devil and fear of that devil, hell, damnation, are the same thing. Breathe that in. Our invitation is to be crystal clear as to what we have faith in and to align with truth to such a degree as to allow this life-affirming faith to have us. To faith as spirit faiths. Yes, I turned that into a verb. Because if faith has us, it's not just something we have, but faith has us. Faith is us. Faith is moving, living, and having its beingness as us, then, in the same way that I can love someone as a verb, then I can faith someone 
as a verb. If I can move as love, then I can faith. I can move as faith. Breathe. So let faith have you. Let it move you. Let it be your thoughts. Let it be your words. Let it be your feelings. And let it be your actions. Breathe. This week's spiritual practice or practices, journal about what are you afraid of? What scares you? And I mean, really, what are you afraid of? So if you say, I am afraid of losing my job, that's not what you're afraid of. Because if someone said, go ahead and quit your job and I'll give you $10 million. Most of us quit my job. You're going to give me $10 million. Can you give me an extra two? Yeah, I'll give you 12. Boop. Yes, I'm tendering my letter of resignation, IBM. Thank you for the years. Bye, Google. Bye. I, I love you, but I'm gone. I'm, I'm a millionaire now. So you're not afraid of losing your job. You're not afraid of losing a marriage. You're not afraid of, like, what are you really, af what is underneath that statement of, I am afraid of being homeless? Nope. Beneath that, there's something else that is being indicated. What is that? And then what or who do you have faith in? Do you have faith in yourself? Do you have faith in your minister? Do you have faith in your center? Do you have faith in your government? Do you have faith in God? Why? What or how does it serve you to have faith in whatever that is? or whoever that is. How does it serve you? How does it benefit you? And then have a conversation with three people about what it means and what it looks like to live with less fear and more faith and what it means for faith to have you. In other words, what does it mean for you to not simply have faith in God, but to have the faith of God, the faith that God has in and of itself, simply. The faith that grass has to grow. The faith the sky has to be blue. The faith that rainbow has to show a myriad of colors. It doesn't question. There's never a moment where the rainbow says, oh man, I wonder if I'm going to be gray today. You know, when, anytime I show up as those seven shades of gray, just, uh, everybody judges me. They can't get to the pot of gold at the end of me because I'm gray. There are no lucky charms because it's gray. The rainbow doesn't do that. The rainbow simply says, boom, check me out. Boom, look at how amazing I am. When we have faith the way the universe has faith, then we recognize our own divine magnificence and we fear less because we are faithful. This week's declaration or affirmation, I will say it first. And if you feel in alignment with me, with this, say it with me on the second go round. I share and spread my love, trust, and joy with the world. Together. I share and spread my love, trust, and joy with the world. Breathe. Now let's anchor and ground, recognizing that everything that has been said is good and oh so good because it's true. You are awesome. You are magnificent. You are the very power and presence. Life itself, there is only one life and that life is God and that life is your life right now. That life is living, moving and having its beingness as everyone and everything. And so we anchor in this prayer of being faithful and we allow our faith to overflow to such a degree that this faith moves the very ground in the Ukraine. It moves the very ground in the Middle East. It moves the very ground in Korea. It moves the very ground of the earth itself. The earth itself, the soil is radiating with this energy of faith. The air we breathe is radiating with this energy of faith and love. The water we drink, the sky we see, the breeze we feel, the sunlight we feel, all of it 
this contaminating force of peace and equity and justice, knowing that there is only one mind and that mind is God. And therefore, right now, we anchor and ground understanding and knowing that this mind is a mind of peace. And this mind is the mind of everyone and everything. So every leader, every military individual, Every civilian, all right here and right now, grounded deeply, connected powerfully to the one mind, as the one mind, in the one mind. Faith has all of us. Peace has all of us. Love has all of us. And right now, we speak this word knowing that this thing we call a world that works for all is manifesting and demonstrating even now because our faith moves mountains. We allow the law to say yes, because that's what it does. And because it says yes, this that has been spoken and sung and prayed and spiritually practiced and signed is the very demonstration of God acting upon itself. It is answered prayer already. And so I allow it to be that by saying, and so it is, amen. Thank you, everybody. Much love. See you over in Zoom.